Welcome to number two. Uh, this is our second lecture in uh, blood and blood spatter. Uh, again, it's a uh, spatter, not splatter. So um, here we go. In uh, this lecture, we're going to take a look at uh, why blood spatter is used in uh, forensics and uh, some of the ways that it's used. And uh, if nothing else, I hope that you kind of get out of this that there's some pretty smart folks out there that can recreate an awful lot of information from blood that's been left behind. So uh, we'll also look a little bit at the physics of uh, blood droplet characteristics and uh, the six main spatter pattern types. Uh, we'll see that sometimes they're not as clear cut as just uh, this has to be this. It could be a, a hodgepodge or sort of a combination of several spatter patterns. Um, you'll get a uh, just an intro to um, determining the direction that blood was traveling and its uh, origin, which is a fancy way of saying where it came from. We'll look more at both of those in the uh, last section, as well as the uh, angle of impacts. So uh, finally, we'll see that um, you know in crime scenes, blood is again you know a very very useful piece of information and uh, some of the tools that investigators have to um, take a look at it. So first up, if we talk about blood spatter. Uh, how, would, how would you define that? It's really kind of got two components to that definition. One, it, it's a group of blood stains or blood letting that's been left behind. And uh, two, it's got to help to recreate an event. So if you're looking at the picture here, um, it doesn't really take too much thought to figure, man, this must have traveled from top right sort of down to bottom left. Um, we can get us to a spot, though, to where just beyond that direction, um, we can figure out some more information. And uh, the really good people at this, they can determine the angle at which that the blood must have let and exactly where that point of origin would have come from. Now, bear with me here, because uh, some of the videos that we'll see and uh, cases that we refer to, um, that's the experts. We're just scratching the surface here with an introduction to uh, a lot of different forensic science topics. So blood spatter, um, it, it, again, it's, it's useful for an awful lot of things. It can help give investigators um, a, a determination of the direction that the blood was traveling. Um, it can give them an angle of impact. That could be important, you know, if um, a lot of this gets used to either corroborate or, uh, you know, refute somebody's statements or an eyewitness's observations. If they know that the angle of impact was low and somebody says they had to defend themselves and they were standing, um, you know, that might not jive. Uh, the point of origin can be determined. And like I said before, we'll look more at that in the uh, last section. And uh, sometimes just from um, certain blood spatter patterns that are left behind, you could determine the cause of death or the, the manner of death. So before we get into the patterns, let's just have a little physics lesson here. Um, blood exists on Earth, and like all things on Earth, it must obey the laws of physics. So what we're looking at here in this picture a droplet, and it's kind of like, think of it as like a time-lapse photo, sort of like a before and after. And uh, this little dropper is releasing one drop of blood. So, thinking of the physicist's mind, or a physician's mind, or excuse me, a physicist's mind, um, you know, what would be the force that's pulling that blood down? Gravity, right? I mean, you know, gravity pulls everything down. And again, blood exists on Earth, so it has to follow the laws of physics just like everything else. And if we look at this, the reason that that blood droplet is getting stretched and pulled down is, again, the force of gravity. But if you look at what happens when that blood droplet sort of stretches and then snaps in the second picture here, like where we see that we've got the droplet sort of reforming or it's uh, basically like becoming circular again, the reason for that is blood won't fall apart because of this cohesive force. And uh, blood has a fairly cohesive force. So when I talk about cohesion or a cohesive force, uh, it's really just a fancy way of saying something that wants to stick together. So like co is the prefix there. It just means like with or together. And blood does have that cohesive force. So even though gravity's yanking on it, it naturally wants to stay together. So that'd be a little bit different than like what we see here on the right. That would be a handful of confetti. You know, if you took a, a piece of paper and you cut it up into a bunch of small little pieces and you dropped it, yes, gravity would pull those 
little bits of paper. It would pull that confetti down. But what you wouldn't see is a cohesive force where it wants to come back together. So if you look at the picture on the left, that's water. And water's, you know, one of the major components of what makes up blood, right? And uh, water behaves a lot like blood. Uh, if we look at the picture here, we see that it's being stretched down by gravity, but it also kind of wants to stay together because of that cohesive force. So you might not think of water as like a sticky substance, but it turns out it is pretty sticky. And I understand that by comparison, the viscosity between blood or water or like syrup, they're all going to be different, but there is that cohesive force to blood holding it together. So here we've got a blood spatter pattern. And uh, what we're looking at here is a blood droplet that hit a surface and we see that like that big circle in the middle almost looks kind of like a little solar system set up here. That would be what we refer to as the main droplet. So cohesion wanted that to stay together. It hit or it had a force or an impact on that surface and that impact force was great enough to where some of the little bits of blood couldn't stay together. In other words, impact force and cohesion, it was like a tug of war, and they came to a uh, abrupt battle, and uh, these little droplets that are ejected out, that would be indicative of um, the cohesion losing to the impact force. So all these little guys on the outskirts we call satellites. So you hear the term satellite, you might think of like, Oh, in space, something orbiting around the Earth. Yeah, it's a little object outside of Earth. Uh, when we talk about blood spatter, a satellite's just a secondary drop. And the way that that formed was the impact was greater than the cohesive force of the main droplet. So I get that this isn't, you know, a real picture, but uh, I found it online and I think it works pretty well to show uh, the next characteristic of some of these spatter patterns. Um, this we see spikes or sometimes they're called spines. So if you take a look at this, you've got some stretchies and then you've got like some ejections or a better way of saying that is there's some satellites where the cohesive force failed, the impact force was greater and bits of blood, these secondary droplets were ejected and formed satellites. Some of the characteristics on this droplet, the cohesive force was stretched but not broken. So you've got just kind of like these little stretchies or these little spikes or these spines that are left behind. So a question for thought would be, what's going to cause more or what would require more energy to form, a satellite or a spike? So do you think that it takes more energy for this satellite to form or a spike and why? Here's my thinking. I think that a satellite is going to require more force because it actually has been ejected. It actually broke free from that droplet. Whereas the spike tried, but uh, there just wasn't enough impact force to overcome the cohesive force. So you wound up with a spike or the spine. We'll circle back to that in a bit. Here's a video that um, I've posted on my YouTube. Um, it's uh, under Blood Spatter 101. It wouldn't load properly, but I think it's something that would be worth watching. There's um, a gal in Reno, uh, Nevada, that, that runs a course, and uh, it's got a ton of awesome information on how they would teach this to investigators, and it goes quite a bit more in depth in a relatively short video than we do throughout this course. I would encourage you to watch it. Um, I've got another one that I'll show you that scratches the surface a bit, but this is one that, uh, again, it's posted on my YouTube channel, and I think it's worth the watch. All right, let's get into the six main pattern types. And uh, these were developed by Dr. John Glaster. And we should give credit where credit's due because his work has stood the test of time. Um, you know, this has been around for over a century. Um, he actually kind of put these on the books uh, just around uh, 1902. And these six types are still recognized today. So you've got what's referred to as a passive fall, a gush, or sometimes they're called arterial spurts. You've got splashes, smears, trails, and pools. So these are the six main types. And like I'd mentioned before, you're not always just going to get just this or just that. You might have a combination of an awful lot of patterns that are sort of 
on top of each other. You know, think about a, a brutal fight or, you know, a, a gruesome scene. An awful lot of action could take place where different types of patterns may intertwine with each other. First up, we'll look at the passive falls. And, you know, from this picture here, if I said describe that, I feel like most people would say, well, they're cash are like circles. And that's true. They are circular by nature. That's always that's an indicative trait of a passive fall. And uh, the reason that these are circles, though, like so if I were to say, well, why are these circles? Uh, it's because they basically have fallen and impacted on a surface at about a 90 degree angle. We'll see in the next lecture, as you get further from that 90 degree angle, the more elongated or stretched or oval like those droplets will look. So passive falls often have satellites and spikes. And those are terms that you should be kind of familiar with, right? The satellite is just the secondary drop that's been ejected from the main drop. And the spike is like a stretch that's coming off of the main drop. But there just wasn't quite enough force there to have it break free. Here we've got gushes or arterial spurts. And uh, this would be where some pretty substantial damage has occurred. Um, for a gush or an arterial spurt to occur, it's got to be something almost severed. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the picture here with our armless knight, but um, something where the heart is really the pump, the driving mechanism behind this. Uh, think of like a garden hose. If it was, uh, you know, sort of pinched and then cut, all that water would just kind of release real quickly. This can happen from the force of your heart, and uh, it's not uncommon to see gushes or arterial spurts real high up on a wall or even up on a ceiling. Three, splashes. We're going to get more into splashes in the last lecture, but right now I want you to just know, okay, they kind of have this exclamation point shape. And uh, that means that there's like, you know, think of an exclamation point, like, you know, your punctuation, and the splashes actually chase the dot. And we'll see that's referred to as the tail. So it sounds kind of goofy that something would chase its tail, but uh, that's the way the terminology works. And like I said, we'll, we'll get more into that in the next one. Splashes are great for determining the location where bleeding started and uh, the direction that the blood was headed. Um, there's this process called stringing where they can actually run a calculation and determine where exactly above the ground that the bloodletting must have occurred. But for now, we're just grappling with an intro, right? We've got splashes. All right, they look like exclamation points and they help us uh, show direction of blood travel. Smears. Doesn't take much of an investigator here to uh, determine that that was probably two bloody hands that brushed up or were, were placed against this wall. And uh, you can actually get kind of a, a feel for direction here as well. It looks like those hands were drugged down. So smears don't have to be handprints. Really anything that had blood on it, you know, and brushed up against something else and left that kind of like smudge or well, smear for <laughs> the best term we could use behind, um, that would cause uh, the fourth pattern type, a smear. Fifth one, trails. Uh, this could be a hodgepodge of a lot of different patterns. Um, basically a trail just shows you long movement from place to place. And it could be, again, a combination of a lot of the other five pattern types. So what we're looking at here is a deer that was shot in the woods, and you can actually make off towards the top of the picture there, a hunter that's tracking the deer. How did they follow that deer? By following the trail of blood. And we'll get more into that in the third lecture as well. Last one is a pool. So usually when we say pooling occurs, it just means like a buildup. And that's exactly what a uh, pool and the blood spatter pattern is. It's going to be where somebody was stationary and some heavy bleeding took place in the same spot and the blood pooled up or was built up. So in the picture here, um, some unfortunate individual was hit by an automobile. They were lifted off the ground and where they landed is where they stayed. And they bled out in that spot for an extended period of time causing a pool. So look at these two. Hopefully, you could refer back to your notes and uh, maybe even kind of say, all right, I know this is this or that is that. On the left, we've got a passive fall. And I don't know what exactly caused the bleeding from this picture. But what I do know is that that blood must have hit that surface at about a 90 degree angle. And the reason I can tell that is it's got that circular characteristic. Um, I could probably uh, give you a good idea what the surface was, but I want to get back to that in a little bit as well and talk about the picture on the right. That would be 
it looks like, again, you know, you can make an argument off towards the right there. You've got pooling. But I would just kind of refer to this as splashes. And yes, I see some circular drops in there that look like they're going to be um, passive falls as well. So there's a combination of things there. But all those long, stretched out droplets, those would be your uh, splashes. And they're really useful for us being able to determine the direction. Um, again, we'll get back into that more with the uh, third and final lecture of this unit. So on the left here, we see what's referred to as mystification. And mystification occurs during a high velocity impact. So a couple of things here. One, sometimes I'll say, well, there's a high velocity impacts and then there's low velocity impacts. And people will assume that, oh, well, the high velocity, velocity just means speed. You know, the high speed impact, that would be something that's worse than the low velocity impact. Um, that's probably not so bad. No, no, no. Uh, low velocity impact could definitely be fatal. So the mystification from the high velocity impact that we see on the left, that'd be something like a gunshot wound where so much force hits the body or the blood so quickly that it literally just shreds the blood into little tiny droplets that we call mystification. Think of kind of like a little water squirt bottle where the water is in those real fine droplets. Um, that can happen to blood when a high velocity impact occurs. So a low velocity impact, that'd be some, I mean like if someone got hit in the head with a hammer or a baseball bat, that could obviously be fatal. But the blood droplets that are left behind or the spatter patterns that are left behind, they would look more like what we refer to as low velocity impacts. So you're going to have larger clumps of blood or larger patterns of blood where the high velocity has got that mystification. Let's see if this guy goes because this is a good one. All right, let's watch this. Uh, this is another... Um, Reno investigator teaching the course. Time after time, they have to search through bloody crime scenes looking for clues. But more often than not, the bloody scene is the clue they're looking for. Crime team reporter Dave Malkoff joins us now to explain. Yeah, we've been working on this story for quite a while, and what we're about to show you is real human blood. It may make some people uneasy, but it is the way that murders are solved here in Las Vegas. Tonight, the crime team looks at the science of murder. A violent death, a bloody murder. Bloodstains on the wall are far from a random spattering. There's many different ways to solve murder cases. Sometimes the dead speak in a macabre tongue. The blood talks through a science called blood spatter analysis, an extremely rare police discipline. Currently, throughout the world, there are 21 individuals who are certified. And out of those 21, there are four in Las Vegas that were for Metro. And that there's blood in this water. Daniel Holstein and Joe Matvey are two of the four. They spent a long yeah, time studying for this certification time. and a long time experimenting. These experiments won't work with just red paint or animal blood. You're dealing with the murder investigation here. It's got to be authentic. Other bloods are similar, but they're not necessarily the same. The surface tension, the viscosity, there might be other areas within the blood that will not be consistent with human blood. So they use real human blood. Blood that Daniel draws from his family, friends. Co-workers, myself, family, whoever I can get it from. This experiment required one more volunteer. Although this blood has been tested so that we know there's nothing wrong with it, sure. we do want to take some standard safety precautions. Real human blood on the sponge. A simulated crime on the wall. The blood has been forced from the sponge onto the wall. As the blood begins to separate, the story comes together. This is consistent with what we call medium velocity forceful impact spatter. From the stain and the stain alone, they know that the murder weapon was a blunt instrument. You can see this blood here, you can see that it's somewhat elongated and that there are tails on portions of the blood. You'll see that here, the tail is actually the direction that the blood is going. Even if the body has been moved in some way, the experts can reconstruct the crime, either through a mathematical equation or... This is a good one. ...through a method called stringing. That is the position of the victim and the assailant at the time of bloodletting. They can even tell the difference between a murderer who walked away. You can see that the blood drops are, for the most part, circular in nature. 
And that's because he was moving at a slow speed. And a murderer who took off running, leaving spiny edges to his blood trail. They don't even have to actually see the blood to know it's there. We use what's called luminol. Can we shuffle it? And out of the darkness, a crime presents itself. What once appeared to be a clean towel is now glowing as a dull blue-green clue, answering murderous questions. Was the body moved? Was there some type of force? Maybe the object was dropped on the ground. Or maybe a murderer oh, tried to clean his tracks. Sparkling. Just try it. It only creates more glowing and evidence. All that sparkling is showing that there has been cleaned, and possibly with such as a bleach or some form of a cleanser, and this is very indicative of that the crime scene has been cleaned up. A similar technique works for bloody footprints. So Daniel's going to apply some human blood to the bottom, the tread or outsole portion of Mr. Malkoff's boot. The first bloody footprint is easy to see. The last, not so easy. This spray reacts with the iron in blood. The faint blood impression of the footwear pattern is greatly enhanced. Metro's crime scene investigators are constantly striving to gain more knowledge every day. But my, the bottom line is here is I'm, I'm here to assist and help determine the truth and the facts of the case. Blood on the wall of crime scene never lies. Once you know its language, it speaks yeah. volumes. It has a story to tell. The challenge for us is to identify the physical evidence at the crime scene and determine what that evidence has to tell us. And you know that evidence solved murders almost every week here in Las Vegas. In fact, we all remember the Margaret Rudin millionaire murder case. Well, that bloodstain evidence in the bedroom actually helped convict Margaret Rudin of her husband's murder. So that's this science put into practical use. This is so interesting, it's isn't it? It yeah, really it is. is. You can really get into it. Now, four people in, in Nevada that do it. Yeah. 21 in the entire world? Is yeah, that right? four, four people right here at Metro. Yeah, 21 wow. in the entire world. In fact, uh, a couple of those people who are with Metro are certified to teach other people in the world how to do this. And other police agencies anywhere in the world can learn from Metro right here. So all right, cool, right? A uh, lot of neat stuff between you know using the luminol to try to figure out stuff that had been cleaned up, or just uh, whether somebody you know walked or hightailed it out of there, the direction things were traveling, the um, you know the angles at which that it came from. Um, it's uh, pretty crazy how much stuff they can get out of there. So I'm going to cycle back to a question I asked you: What would require more force to form a spike or a satellite? So hopefully you're at a spot where you could look at that and say, all right, Cash, that appears to be a passive fault, circular. Bet you it hit at 90 degrees. I think those spikes, cohesion of blood, fought and kind of won and kept that intact with the main droplet, where the satellites, they lost. There's too much force, and they were ejected, and they caused these secondary droplets around the main. And I'd say, goodness gracious, look how much you've learned. You're speaking like a blood spatter expert. So... What the heck is this? Cash, it's a pillow. You're right. Uh, I found it on a forensic site. But uh, anyways, it's supposed to be a, a blood spatter pillow. And if I said, which of the six do you think this was supposed to be? A pool. Because we've got a lot of bleeding from a stationary person for an extended period of time. I would say this is a smear. Do I see some other stuff in there? I do. But if I had to pick one of the six, I would go smear. Oof, this should look familiar, right? Passive fall, cash, too easy. I see the spikes in the satellites. So this is one where I think you could make some uh, debate. Uh, I was actually going with a trail. Um, the resolution here doesn't seem to have showed up as well as what it was on my uh, computer screen, but there was blood that just went down the sidewalk. Um, could you find passive falls and splashes and, you know, who knows, a gush or a pool at the end of it. Absolutely. But I was kind of thinking of a trail for this one. But again, I think you could argue otherwise for, or maybe not otherwise, but for some uh, other patterns as well. Here, splashes. Other stuff going on? Absolutely. But I see a ton of those exclamation point shapes that we'll look at later that uh, are really, really good at giving us the direction in which the blood traveled. Here, oof, look how high up those are. Looks like almost kind of individual bursts or spurts or gushes. 
So if you said arterial spurts, that's also correct, but uh, that's what this was supposed to show. You know, the driving mechanism for that, again, is a heart. Uh, somebody suffered a pretty substantial wound, and it's not uncommon to see these high up on a wall or even a ceiling. So that is our second section of blood and blood spatter. As always, you got questions, concerns, please reach out and see me. Hopefully you got something out of it. Till we meet again, be safe.